This is a uh, recovery compilation that I put together on Block Talk Radio uh, at my 28th year clean. And uh, I'm 29 years clean now. It's, uh, oh, January 2017. Now I'm still doing well. Uh, but uh, the story breaks in uh, where I uh, was playing some music and uh, and uh, that was appropriate to uh, my Vietnam tour. And um, so you'll understand that it just kind of <laughs> cracks right in there. But uh, I think it's the best um, that, that I've done and the most honest and the most detailed uh, on uh, recovery from the disease of addiction. So uh, enjoy that, and uh, I, I pray that it, it does help somebody. effects of heroin and opium and all that stuff until you're out of a war zone <laughs> and uh, you come home. You come home. And I, I hesitated for two weeks. And um, there was a girl that I was looking forward to uh, seeing. Um, sounded like uh, she loved me, but I guess brotherly love and sisterly love, you know, <laughs> you get confused. But I stayed in California with my friends in San Francisco, and I noticed when I drank, I was getting a little uh, rowdy and a little loud, and uh, of course, I met some uh, semi-rich people over there. Uh, they were rich, uh, you know, old women with no wrinkles, you know, <laughs> and uh, they had a sauna in there. We stunk, and um, we had blackheads all over our faces, and. Uh, yeah, it took me a couple, a couple of weeks I stayed there, and uh, I, I didn't want to leave my friends. And uh, one of them got heroin um, shipped to him, about a baby food jar full. And uh, so the few days before I left California, I was able to do some more heroin because my leg was starting to ache. I was starting to jones. I was starting to get sick. And uh, alcohol wasn't cutting it, and... Uh, I came back on the plane and just about blacked out. Uh, I took some what, what they called California Reds and, and knocked myself out. Uh, I didn't want to fly. I didn't want to be in elevators. I didn't want to be in any public transportation. Long story. Um, I just recently got over them, um, those fears and anxieties um, within a few years. And I'm 64 years old now, so <laughs> uh, it takes a while. Uh, for, for some things to subside, and uh, well, I got home and uh, took the bus to Bellingham from Boston, and and I got off the bus. No more public transportation. That's it. No one is taking me up in a helicopter or planes and props, and no one's doing that no more. No one's in charge of my life. I'm hitchhiking, okay, <laughs> and that's what I did, and I hitchhiked about maybe maybe five miles six miles, and uh, that was my way of coming ba back into, uh, like, Pink Floyd's song, uh, kicking around a piece of ground in your hometown, da-da-da, and that kind of thing, and uh, then they had a party for me. My father built a room uh, and a bar, and uh, uh, he punched out two kids the night I was home, and uh, there was bloodshed, <laughs> oh boy. And uh, the girl I thought was going to be there had something else going on. So I was very depressed. And I, you know, my self-esteem wasn't that great. So that's a big part of the story, you know, self-esteem, depression, uh, not thinking you're worth or as good as anyone, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I started drinking and and signing for... for uh, cough syrup, um, codeine. You had a sign for it in the pharmacies back in, uh, you know, 71. And uh, and that would at least simulate the nod because I didn't want to use needles. And I knew that the heroin here was cut, was junk. And I'd already experienced all that crap before I left. And, uh, you know, it was hard to find what we considered good dope. 
And uh, oh, I, uh, by the way, I had a <laughs> I had a sign on a, on one of these uh, goo cats they call them uh, rice hats, and uh, it said "No hope without dope." <laughs> you know, like, I can't find the picture. It's very funny uh, now that I, I look back and I I've made it through uh, the horrors of addiction. I mean, I came home with a brand new stereo shipped from um, uh, Japan, the best stuff you could get. Six. Way Sansui's Pioneer, uh, Akai, Real Real, Automatic Reverse, uh, all that analog, great sound. And uh, you know, by the end of the year, I was selling it to my friends to get high, buying weed, drinking, buying uh, you know, THC. I love THC, mescaline, and uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. I was in and out of work, uh, and uh. And I was depressed, very depressed. And uh, I'm at a party uh, with some people in an apartment, just a couple of people, and they had girlfriends and I didn't have one. So I, out of nowhere, I just smashed holes in the wall in their apartment. And the guy's going like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, man. You know, and uh, I noticed I was getting violent. And I hadn't been real while and I'd just been rowdy and uh, you know rock and roll screaming and um, but after now it was a different story and uh, the drugs were taking a toll and uh, I was told it was a progressive illness and I went to my aunt's and hung around there uh, in Burlington Massachusetts and uh, Party there for a while and dated somebody I wasn't supposed to date, but I did anyway, and uh, she liked me, and uh, I dated another girl, I don't know, but I was extremely jealous and extremely insecure and, and, and all these stupid things, and uh, and everybody just cheats when they're young for some reason, they still do, and uh, that always bothered me because I was loyal like a puppy, but my loyalty could have been uh, mis misplaced because of uh, my self-esteem issues and, and issues like that. I wasn't a complete person to be able to do what they call a searching and fearless moral inventory. I, I would never have been able to do that. And um, so needless to say, the 70s began to be a blackout for me. And uh, I had a fight with this girl, tried to get her keys from her. She was just with some guy at a bar. Next thing you know, I'm driving her car. She jumps in. We're going about 60 miles an hour in a, in a 20. And I uh, bounce off a fence, hit a guy semi head on. He was already crippled. Uh, thank God we didn't hurt him any worse. But uh, he had a punch out on me. And uh, my father had to take care of it. He didn't want to, you know, he was going to have me done, done in. And, uh, you know, life got really screwed up. Uh, and then I met my uh, soon-to-be wife uh, at one of the parties in Burlington at my cousin's. And uh, uh, she was uh, insecure herself a little, and uh, self-esteem was probably not all there either. So we were a great match. Uh, we were going to fix each other, I suppose. And <laughs> it, it never did take place. But, uh, but we had four kids, and... Uh, I uh, I started to, you know, I, I've always prayed to God, you know, and I believe that Jesus is um, the Son of God, and uh, I was brought up with uh, him being crucified, and of course, the way I looked at that was, uh, <laughs> they killed him, <laughs> right? And uh, I'd be like, you assholes, you killed Jesus, man, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I didn't have a... Uh, the faith that uh, some of the so-called uh, Christians have. I don't know if that's the true word for it. Um, but I, I I did pray, and I needed help many, many times. And uh, you had on collisions, cars being left in uh, three towns away, and I'm home barefooted. Where's my car, <laughs> right? So, you know, alcohol was doing me in, but I was using it to get away from all the other stuff. And then later I'd find cocaine. But around 1976, 
I was sitting in a room up in the apartment. My wife is pretty. I have four beautiful children. Nothing could be better. Nothing. And I'm in the other room looking at my photo albums, which and I was back in now. I'm back with my friends. And uh, I've done that ever since. I really have. And uh, I'm okay with it today. I understand it. And uh, I had a guy's preaching about Jesus on TV, but all I ever heard him say was, you know, Jesus loves you. He really does. And I was in tears on my knees. And I felt a little burden lift that morning. And I threw away all my record albums. No one ever told me. I never went to some church. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, I had a hangover. I'm still drinking. And uh, I had, uh, in the the interim, I had a friend uh, bring me to a church in Rentham area. And they gave me a a Bible, King James. And uh, I started reading and uh, learning a little bit anyway. And... and, uh, my Lord flooded me out with joy unspeakable, full of glory, right in front of my friend Chuck, who I grew up with, and right in front of him, and it blew me away. And God called me. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, and people looking at me like, yeah, well, God couldn't possibly call you, you know, what does one look like, right? Okay, so okay, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, you guys are right, but that ain't what I have sensed within my being. And uh, here I am, just getting wasted. And I, 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 I'm actually maintaining. I was trying to quit from 1976 on, and I couldn't relate to the uh, Christian church and them people. They were too stiff. And uh, I found music, Chuck Gerard. <laughs>
Chuck Turad, that's my first cassette of real Jesus people from a Jesus people movement in the 60s. And they hit the streets and brought a great revival. And uh, I became part of that by listening to all this music. I have a lot of it now. And those people would talk to me, even while I was drinking and crying and wishing I could do better for God because I loved them and... I loved the way he made me feel, and, and I knew that he loved me, and I felt him uh, uh, contact me, and nobody believed me, but, you know, I, I know a lot about different religions and cults and all them things, and I had to. I had to fight them, and uh, it was hard, and uh, I'd, I'd try to quit using from 1976 on, and that's when all hell continued to break loose. Uh, it was shortly after I had a head-on collision around October. And now I'm soul-searching. I even gave a 63 Cadillac away, and all I had to do was change the fender. But we hit a guy head-on. We didn't hurt him. And I was in jail, and I woke up yelling at the cops, you know, <laughs> on there from the devil screaming, right? And uh, uh, Frank, the cops are like looking at me like, man, this kid's gone. And, uh, and then I got out of jail four, year, uh, four, day, four hours later, and I'd uh, argue with my wife and steal the money back that I gave her from factory work and uh, go back uptown to drink and uh, to get rid of the hangover I had. Because <laughs> that was in the afternoon. I mean, that was in the afternoon. It was like noontime. We were trying to cop money, trying to cop. And you know how it is. We were hustling and hustling and bustling, going from bar to bar, people to people, looking for money. And a bunch of us would, uh, you know, work hard to, to, to get high together. And, uh, and uh, it was pretty screwed up. And, uh, well, after that head collision, I went back to this church, which uh, was very stiff. But the pastor was very nice. And uh, he used to visit me all the time. And uh, told me I was child of the king, uh, acting like a pauper. And never said I had to give anything up. So, um I did not hear about the disease of addiction um, until maybe around 1980, 81. That's when I shot a needle for the first time. I used a needle uh, for one night with a friend that was shooting cocaine uh, because I noticed the cocaine made my heart go too fast, but if you did a little bit, then it would be um, you could drink and uh, stay up and talk and be stupid. And uh, I shot dope, and I am a carrier of hepatitis B, and I only used a needle once, and uh, that was in 1980, and 1981, I'm back to church, I'm, I'm in and out, and uh, I can't get fellowship, and that's what I desperately needed, and I wasn't close to people because I was a Vietnam vet, I was mean to my wife, I had shame, I had guilt, remorse. Kid got killed with one of my rifles back in 1967, 68. I went to Nam with that on my mind. Never even told anybody. Uh, never told them what happened to me in Vietnam. Never told anybody anything. And people will call me the life of the party. <laughs> Freaking life of the party. And um, I still am kind of a life of the party. Cause <laughs> there's a little bit of Gehenna uh, resting down there somewhere in my butt, and uh, it's just the way I am. And <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'd be at work, and somebody from the Alcoholics Anonymous program uh, was working there, and he would come to me and say, "Look, uh, why don't you come to the program, Charlie? You know, I know you're trying to quit, and uh, you keep ending up in rehab and stuff like that." And and I said, "Nah, I'm good, man. You know, I ain't going there, man. I didn't know what it was. I thought, you know." It can't be an alcoholic because I'm not on the street. I can't be a real d d drug addict because uh, I only use a needle once. So, you know, I was thinking in terms of, oh, other people are worse than me, man. <laughs> you know, but I was as bad as it could get. 
and I, I uh, those pictures are on my other computer. I just redid the one that I'm using for Blog Talk Radio, so you're not going to um, uh, see all the photographs of me uh, either puffed up or uh, so skinny it's, it's pathetic. Um, I, I went through up through hell, and, uh, and I, I don't tell you everything. Um, I stayed there for one-on-one when I'm dealing with somebody, talking with somebody. And uh, I have been everywhere, and I've been molested. Everybody's been molested. Okay, we'll get over it. And uh, but what you, some people, you know, you got to help them out with that. They don't know how to how to work through that. And uh, anyway, I uh, moved up north uh, to New Hampshire, um, and that's the story in itself. And uh, it wasn't my idea. I didn't want to live out in the woods, but I like going up there. And uh, I uh, was clean after rehab for about you know, maybe three or four months, and uh, I think my van broke down a couple times, and I was living in a, uh, a 1961 van with my four kids up in the mountains, and it was starting to snow in September, <laughs> and I kept blowing that you know, t- transmission, that little transmission, and it was a 1960 Econoline uh, with a pop-up, <laughs> and it was cute, and uh that was my excuse. Somebody passed me a beer, and that was it. I drank for nine months and just smoked pot. And I was like a guy that was doing Jack Daniels and very mean and uh, was constantly getting arrested up there in them small towns. And, uh, and then I uh, flipped out on my wife one night and ended up in jail, kicked out of the house. And I got out of the jail, and I realized that... Uh, I, 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 I was wrong. I had sinned, definitely. And I apologized to God. I called on Christ and I said, Lord, you know, I've been trying all these years, studying all these years, and I'm not nothing. And forgive me and show me how to stop this, this user. And because uh, I'm kicked out of the house and... Uh, I've got people from Narcotics Anonymous uh, asking me to go there, but there wasn't very many Narcotics Anonymous meetings in the northern part of New Hampshire. I was up around uh, Littleton area, Lisbon, and then we got a house in Woodsville area. And uh, I decided to go to the program that day after I got out of jail. I drank a half can of beer about four in the afternoon, and I've been clean ever since, 28 years. And I got clean in a tent, 20 feet from the house I partied in with all the new friends that I made. I got clean. I wrote in my Bible, God forgive me. Give me the balance I need in my life. Help me to stay sober, clean. I didn't know what to call it. Addict is an addict. And... uh, and I finally made it to an AA meeting, and uh, they couldn't handle the way I talk and who I was. But some of them, <laughs> some of them would pull me aside, and the younger guys, and big, 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 tall guys, and they would uh, um, let me know that even though I was crazy, they weren't making fun of me when they were laughing. They were uh, understanding me, and I didn't know that. I was going swearing at them and everything, you know. <laughs> and uh, they helped me, and. It, that's what I lacked, and this pastor had told me that, my friend pastor, the only man I ever let in my life to help me, and uh, he told me that years before that I needed fellowship, and I didn't have it, but AA provided it, and I learned that AA was, um, those guys were like apostles to me, Bill and uh, Bill Wilson and uh, Bob Smith, and I have since gone to uh, Bill's house, uh, um, and I've been uh, to Bob's boyhood home for uh, meetings. So, and I helped start first Narcotics Anonymous meetings up there. So I'm not representing um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, but they they come highly recommended by me. Uh, I don't really care for the higher power thing because I know God, and I met people that uh, have been clean as long as I am, and they don't know God's name. Okay. And I thought by now these people I do. I mean, isn't that what they were trying to teach us? <laughs> no. And uh, 
So actually doing this tonight, um, the way I'm doing it is uh, I'm not able to do that um, at a meeting. So I'm kind of spending the t my 28th uh, year anniversary uh, by myself with my three cats and uh, haven't had a phone call all day. And that's the way it is. I got very few friends. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, if it's because I'm an asshole. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. But. You know, they have a hard time dealing with my, my mind. and uh, But uh, the Lord Jesus is my uh, son of the Most High. He's my God. And the Most High calls him God in Hebrews. And, uh, and I stay there. And I take what that program has to offer and I utilize it. And um, I don't believe in the, uh, you know, a Christian, quote, unquote, uh, type of meeting. Uh, I think just the open forum meeting is okay for everybody. And uh, I got a lot of people to thank for uh, hanging in there with me. Um, I haven't used, and maybe once or twice I felt like it. Uh, I got a divorce in the midst of uh, maybe my third year clean. And uh, that's a whole story in itself. Um, a lot of depression, um, lost weight again. Um, Post-traumatic stress issues came out at uh, college. I went to college up in uh, Linden State, Vermont. So I have a degree in psychology and I uh, am music and I can't read a note. And uh, uh, I've always been well-liked. Um, you know, people at the bar just love my company. So they get me high. I really don't need any money. <laughs> All I got to do is go there. And at the present time, I'm a member of uh, a church. And is a is a Baptist church with they believe uh, they are not Protestants. They are not Protestants. They don't have anything to do with that. And they're just Jesus people. And um, I said, as long as that's all it means, okay. Because you're not going to make a bastard out of me. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I have a lot of fun with them. And, uh, you know, it took me years to get to that point because I was so resentful. To so many people and the whole American society, for crying out loud. And, uh, uh, you know, I get them resentments out in funny ways. Like, I went on my first parade uh, on a motorcycle as a Vietnam vet, and I brought a, um, a uh, plastic uh, BB, BB gun, which is a replica of an M16, and I mounted it on my handlebars. Meanwhile, we just had the uh, Boston Marathon. Uh, thing happened uh, two years ago. So I've got fellow agents following me, and I got a camera on my bike just to hear my pipes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, it, it's on YouTube, uh, uh, Busted. Um, there's another one on there, uh, uh, Off to the Parade. <laughs> and uh, you can see it on there. And I'm a gentleman to the cops, and I realize that when I get in there, even though they saw the orange tip, a dead giveaway, and it was double strapped. You couldn't get it off riding a motorcycle. So, you know, I wasn't freaked out, but I was uh, proud to represent um, the people that weren't represented. Um, the American flag was in the rear, and the Australian flag, uh, the Montagnard, and uh, the Arvin, and the uh, Korean, South Korean flag was on my bike. And, uh, it's not a Harley, it's a Yamaha 650 Special 2. And it really is special. It's a non-bobber. It's very cool. And uh, God is good to me. And uh, I don't have a wife, I don't have a woman. Um, I've been through 12 of them after I got divorced uh, in 92. And uh, I think I've had about enough with that. Um, I do have uh, uh, beautiful women in my life here and there, and I enjoy the company. And their husbands, <laughs> I'm not coveting, <laughs> you know. And uh, I make jokes with them, and I and I tell the husbands straight out, and I thank you very much for let me borrow your wife, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, people uh, are pretty cool at my church, and uh, I'm very grateful uh, to, to be a part of that. And uh, so that those programs offer those twelve steps and and that fellowship and. That's the key. And uh, I've got a recording studio right here and all kinds of stuff. So uh, this is a pretty exciting uh, 
life that I live, uh, although I do live it alone. And uh, there are people that misunderstand me from time to time. Uh, they <clears throat> make up their own gods and, uh, hey, you can do whatever you want, you know. Um, but if I know you and I love you, uh, somehow I've got to get you uh, uh, awake to the true God. There's no getting out of that. And that's not a programming from a church or anything. That's in my heart. From the day that I was drinking and working on a hangover and God came into my, I don't know if he came in or he just moved within me because I always believed and uh, he's with those who believe he's not inside everybody. And uh, uh, I was, uh, Isaiah said that the heart of man is desperately wicked and evil above all else. And I don't think. Um, you have to be a soldier to realize that, but a lot of people just don't realize that, and uh, there's the dark side to us, and the atheist will never know that dark side because there's no light to bring about those shadows, and um, Petra's song, Where There's a Shadow, There's a Light, <laughs> and uh, it's a shame, and um, I love people, I enjoy them, um, uh, some of them don't want to tolerate uh, my beliefs and my my mind, and uh, um, and I find their minds um, pretty pretty irritating at times myself. And <laughs> it doesn't mean I hate them. Uh, I don't like your mind, you know. <laughs> but I you know I try to have a good time with people and uh, and try to remain uh, comical. Um, you've been through enough. Um, you earn your comedy. Um, you earn it. You do. And some of you know I, I didn't share everything, but you, you know you can fill in the gaps. Um, I once was lost, and now I'm found. And um, those recovery programs are very helpful. And all the people in the rehab sometimes it isn't just about money. Sometimes there's an individual in there um, that that touches you, and people come along and touches just you, and other people might think they suck, and God sent them just for you, and uh, I don't know if I'm for anybody out there. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't have that kind of a mindset. Um, I'm just celebrating 28 years clean time alone, and uh, I'd like to be doing something else, but um, like I say, uh, my friends weren't available. I hadn't received a phone call. Um, you know, I don't know what's going on in their lives. Um, some of them, you have to just leave them be, and uh, they call you when they are ready. Some of them, you need to call, and they're glad you called. So, you know, it's a tough call. Uh, it's rough being a human one sometimes. And, uh, but um, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to be clean and to be able to share a little bit of the story with you. Um, I went a little over the 90 minutes, so I'll probably make it a two-hour show um, and then just cut it short uh, just to get these uh, recordings um, uploaded uh, onto uh, Blog Talk Radio, and I'm very grateful for Blog Talk Radio. I, I don't abuse it. Um, you very rarely uh, hear me on here. I have a few shows archived. Uh, I pay for it, and I can um, do two-hour shows every day. I, I don't see a person like me doing that. I, I'm just somebody that you should run into once in a while. Um, I think that it's almost irritating uh, to be around someone like me, even though I, I, I like myself, you know. And uh, sometimes I think that, uh, you know, I'll point at somebody in a meeting that's having a hard time and I'll tell them, I am for you, dude. Get over my house. Here's my number. Call me anytime, night or day. I will drop what I'm doing and I'll be of help. You just lost a friend, Phyllis. She cut her wrists. She went into the sex realm, the drugs again, and they killed her. And uh, she literally exploded inside. 
I was the only one at the funeral besides her ex-husband and her two kids. That was sad. It angered me that others hadn't thought about her that way, but she was put in my life, and I guess, you know, you have to work this, this stuff out. And uh, that stuff happens, and I, uh, I, I, do, I make music, but I, I, you know, I'm not out there with it. Um, I make laments um, for people who have passed, and, uh, and I'm glad to be able to do that. Uh, some people don't understand that. Um, I don't care what they do. Um, I do uh, nonverbal laments on my guitar. Um, they can understand uh, those feelings. Uh, they cannot handle my words. Um, I would never have been able to share the Lord like I have uh, with you uh, at a meeting quite the way I want to because you'll be looking at people with question marks on their heads and they're frowning, fidgeting, and uh, uh, people are uh, pointing to their watch saying, uh, oh, 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 you're going over, you're going over. You know, I'm like, I'm not in the mood for your pressure, okay? I play, I pay for blog talk radio, and... Uh, I share my story, and uh, it includes my God, and because he's the one that led these people to me and led me to those meetings and then showed me what to take from the meetings that was that the other believers weren't able to supply me with. Now, in these days, 2014, there are churches with rehabs right in them and uh, rehabilitation and prayer and all that, and... Uh, I don't think that they should mess with Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous in any way. Um, just leave people alone. Um, leave them alone. and Because uh, you can't get help in there. Um, I like to mention the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and how he's given his life for me. And uh, he rose from the dead, and I believe it. And I don't deserve uh, the blessing uh, from him that I have. I can see that there's pieces of me that are not character defects. No, it is, it is a, in myself only. This is a sin nature I'm dealing with. And the disease of addiction for me is a demon. It has a voice that speaks the same to everyone. The same voice, the same things, over and over. Thousands of people. I'm 10,206 days clean. Do I know what I'm talking about after 10,206 days clean? You be the judge. Thank you for letting me share uh, my testimony with you. I didn't get to all the music. I, I kind of muffed it up because I went upside down. Because <laughs> I, I put the songs on there, just look at it, and I do stuff last minute, and I say, well, usually I organize it, but um, I, I didn't know where I would be. Uh, so it was probably about seven songs I did not play for you. Uh, I like playing music for people. I think it speaks um, uh, to the heart. Um better than um, someone like myself just, uh, uh, you know, um, professing, <laughs> you know, you know it, it, there's a, there's a built-in rebellion in us, and Bill and Bob covers that. So what N.A. doesn't cover, if you read, um, you know, like Pass It On and those early books uh, from A.A., you'll read about that rebellion, and you'll read about, you know, you put down drugs and then you pick up sex. You know what I mean? And you know, you buy things, you know. And uh, disease of addiction, I, I go along with. Um, I, I That concept was helpful because I didn't need to think that uh, I was a bad person. But I was. And uh, I'm not that good now. And it's not that I'm doing so much wrong. It's just that I know that I know what I'm made of. And, uh, and that's between me and my God. So uh, I'm not deceived um, at, at what, we're, uh, what we are as humans. And uh, I keep a close watch in the world and uh, see where it's going and what it's doing. Um, I'm not always just concerned about other addicts. I'm concerned about everything about everybody.
And I don't like everybody, but I love them, which means that I don't do them any harm. And even if they're my enemies and they've made themselves my enemies, I, I, I don't do them any harm. And the resentment's only going to eat me up, so you know, eventually that has to uh, has to go, and they come and go. So uh, you know, we'll we'll live a life on its own terms, they say. And uh, I'm very grateful um, for the people uh, in Shelterville. Um, they are uh, quite a refreshment for me, a uh, place of rest from the world. I know they perfectly understand God, who He is what he's about, and what he'd like to see in us. And I don't have to wrestle with them about that. And some of the folks at meetings, you have to, and I don't want to. I, I shy away from it, and uh, uh, there's no debates. Um, people would say um, black and white one way, and there ain't no gray area. I don't care what they do. <laughs> I'm not concerned with what they do. Um, none of them have been to war. None of them know what it's like to be at a fireworks and say, this is boring. Uh, they don't know a lot uh, of how I feel, why I feel that way. And um, I'm not saying I'm unique, but I meet the people uh, from the Iraqi war, uh, from uh, Afghanistan war. Uh, Desert Storm, uh, some Vietnam vets, and I'm telling you, uh, we get a view of the world um, firsthand, um, and feelings that go along with that, that you, you can't uh, convey to other people. I don't care how many movies they've seen about stuff and how many documentaries, you know. You either watch a documentary or you are a documentary. <laughs> you know, so anyway, they call me the great I am, right? I don't care what they do. It took years for me to accept myself. And um, I'm precious. Um, I had to see myself that way and as Andy Charles. And the people out there, you're all precious, uh, even though some of you suck and <laughs> you need to get your hearts right with God. And that includes getting rid of the drinking and drugging. I mean, uh, it's medication, and uh, it, it, it goes bad. It's experiment. <laughs> the experiment turns on you. And uh, I don't want to see you die. I don't want to see you cut your wrist. But you could get clean and sober, and still, like the Lord said, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world? And lose his own soul. Mood swings.